us taking it to the next level is gonna be a problem because it's gonna be money problems. I can see it already. So I caught a couple of threats, a couple of you know passes by in the street and everything else. I caught a couple of threats, and I was sitting there uh, going to pick up my sister from work. And I'm in her car. I'm driving her car to go pick her up from work. I just was sitting in the chair and I was like, God, I'm so tired of everything that's going on. I was in my sister. Rolling Stone recently published an investigative report that provides new insights into the tragic story of Craig Mack, the first artist to leave bad boy records. Additionally, 50 Cent, working on a highly anticipated documentary about Diddy, has shared more information about Craig Mack's life revealing alarming details about his negative turn after encountering Diddy. Initially, Craig faced difficulties working under Diddy's control at Bad Boy, and when he finally managed to break free, his situation worsened. After experiencing traumatic events, Craig Mack fell into the clutches of a doomsday cult that specifically targeted individuals like him. This disturbing story takes an even darker turn when we discover that Craig is not the only artist who turned to religion after encountering Diddy. Artists like Mace, Shine, and Loon also needed to cleanse their souls after dealing with Diddy. Unfortunately, Craig Mack's heart gave out at the young age of 47. His time with Diddy left him deeply scared to the point where he contemplated taking Diddy's life. The question remains, what truly happened to Craig Mack? What factors led to his mental and emotional breaking point of during his tenure at Bad Boy? What revelations concerning Craig's premature demise were uncovered by Rolling Stone and 50 Cent? Let's go into these details and discover the answers. The life of Craig Mack was marked by tragedy. Craig Jameson Mack, also known as Craig Mack, was born in the Bronx but grew up on Long Island. In his early days, he adopted the stage name MC Yeezy and began rapping as a teenager. His undeniable talent led him to embark on tours early in his music career. In a 1995 interview with the New York Times, Craig revealed that his cousins were the ones who initially introduced him to rap when he was just nine years old. By the age of 12, he was already writing his lyrics. Reflecting on his early inspirations, he expressed his desire to emulate LL Cool J and run DMC. Starting his musical journey at such a young age allowed Craig to interact with established artists. Craig's journey in the industry was greatly influenced by his association with experienced professionals, including Alvin Tony. This connection proved pivotal in both the successes and challenges of Craig's career. Alvin Tony arranged a meeting for Craig to showcase his rapping skills in front of Sean Diddy Combs. Diddy was highly impressed and promptly extended a record deal to Craig under his newly established label, Bad Boy Records. Craig was the first rapper to release music under the Bad Boy banner. His hit single, Flavor in Ya Ear, in 1994 became extremely popular, reaching the top of the charts and hitting number one on Billboard's US US Hot Rap Songs. The remix of this track also gained legendary status, marking the rise of the notorious B.I.G. B.I.G. and one of Busta Rhymes' early solo moments. Craig was highly acclaimed in the business, with everyone anxiously anticipating his next release following his successful first album. In a 1994 interview on MTV Raps, Diddy Now in 1997, Craig released his second album without the bad boy, but it had a different level of success than his debut. None of the singles made it onto the charts and he could not replicate his early success. Fast forward to 2002, when Craig appeared in the music video for Diddy's hit song, I Need a Girl Part 1, raising hopes that he might be preparing for a comeback. Craig teased fans with the song Mackenzie in 2006. Still, after that, he largely vanished from the hip-hop scene until 2012, when a shocking video leaked on YouTube 
and revealed that he had joined a cult called Overcomer Ministry in Walterboro, South Carolina. Word on the street was that Craig was working on his third studio album in 2002, with plans to release it in 2007. Gets even more sinister than that. Ralph Gordon Stare, the Overcomer Ministries leader and the older man you just saw hugging Craig in the video, turned out to be anything but holy in December 2017, after being arrested on a long list of charges that included some heinous crimes involving young people. Overcomer Ministry was not your typical church setup. It was a secluded Christian commune of about 70 people, all living together in a kind of isolated, self-sufficient community cut off from the outside world. They lived in mobile trailers, individuals in his cult. Despite this, Craig Mack stayed with Overcomer Ministry until his last days, even as his health deteriorated. What led Craig Mack to become a member of this cult? Sadly, Stair passed away before he could be prosecuted. You won't be shocked to learn that Diddy is part of this narrative. How did he go from being a rising star in the rap business to being a broken man in a cult? Here is the scoop from Rolling Stone's most recent investigative study. Rolling Stone has released an investigative report that reveals some disturbing, never-before-heard revelations concerning Craig's tenure at Bad Boy Records. Trust me, there's a lot to process while reading this story. It turns out that, back in the mid-1990s, Craig and Estee Knight were, in fact, discussing jumping ship to death row records. Even though he had the massive hit, Flavor in Your Ear, essentially the anthem that made Bad Boy Records famous, Craig seriously considered going to death row. The report says that things got so bad for Craig at Bad Boy that he tried to file for bankruptcy to get out of his contract. His sophomore album, Operation Get Down, was stuck in limbo until 1997, and he was feeling the heat but he couldn't break free due to frequent arguments with Diddy and strict bankruptcy laws. At that point, Sug Knight entered the picture, and the two reportedly began talking about Mac joining Death Row's East Coast Post Division. Shove Knight flew Craig to Los Angeles and presented him with a significant opportunity. Craig seemed ready to go to Death Row with a $200,000 advance and a staggering $11.25 million recording budget. But things quickly became complex when Bad Boy learned of these covert discussions and intervened to give Craig a chance to get out of his Bad Boy contract. Craig was forced to revoke his bankruptcy filing and consent to forfeit a portion of his prospective death row earnings. But just as everything appeared to be coming together, Tupac's tragic death in September 1996 rocked the hip-hop world, including Death Row. With Tupac gone, Craig's plans for his future on Death Row vanished, leaving him in an even more precarious situation. Craig's ex-wife informed Rolling Stone, Roxanne Alexis Hill Johnson, that he was afraid Puff was enraged. I feel like Puff's was the trigger because he set off the chain of events that caused my family's downfall. He was the catalyst, and just when you thought it couldn't get any more tragic, Mac was leaving bad boy, and the fact that he was going to go with SJ. From what I understand, the Puff was furious, Roxanne added. Puffy turned into a vindictive bastard and stuck it to him for doing that. When news surfaced on March 12, 2018, it was claimed that Craig, who was just 47 years old, had died suspiciously of heart failure. However, Rolling Stone revealed shocking information on Craig's cause of death. It turns out he didn't die of congestive heart failure. The sole well-known individual in attendance at the funeral, DJ Scratch, said that there was something odd about the day. Scratch subsequently shared a photo of Craig's obituary and a statement stating that the funeral was peculiar. The funeral was held at Craig's birthplace on Long Island, New York. I have never attended a funeral, for the thing that makes me smile the most about this strange day is that, as I mentioned earlier, 
Reports stated that Craig's death was caused by heart failure. At the time, there was a lot of speculation that Craig didn't receive treatment for his heart problems because of his involvement with a controversial cult whose members ostensibly don't believe in modern medicine. However, just when you thought you had heard everything, Rolling Stone released a shocking report claiming that Craig's death was caused by the certificate stated that HIV AIDS was the cause of death and that Craig declined to seek treatment. We don't know when Craig received the diagnosis, but it said he was aware of it before joining the Overcomer cult. Hold on to your seats because things will get even more bizarre. Fans are rife with wild theories suggesting that Diddy may have been involved in Craig's death. Some even speculate that Diddy may have intentionally infected Craig with the virus. Recall back in the late 1990s, there were all these crazy rumors about people allegedly receiving HIV injections as a means of getting rid of them without leaving a trace. Trace remember when she joked about injecting people with HIV and mentioned Easy Woe. On March 16, 1995, he announced his diagnosis to the public. A month later, on March 26, 1995, Ease passed away from pneumonia related to AIDS. At first, no one thought there was anything strange about E's death, especially since it was reported that he had contracted the virus from a partner by the week of March 20th, while he was still in the hospital. E's also sent his fans a final, cryptic message, warning them against getting involved with what he called their institution. Since AIDS was first recognized as a death sentence in the 1990s, many conspiracy theories have surfaced. The most persistent of these theories blames Shug Knight. It's unclear when this theory first appeared, but the actor brought it up during his infamous interview with 